into the Atlanta Sports Party, your home for the best Atlanta sports talk. It's local insight. You can't get anywhere but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Anitra Batiste, and here with me is Maria Martin, and we'll have a special guest for you guys later on in the show. The Atlanta Sports Party is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, it's been a few days since the Atlanta Hawks locked up that number one spot. That's in my ludicrous voice, kind of, sort of. We'll talk about where we all are now on it with our special guest, Brad Rowland from Locked On Hawks. And it's officially dream season. So Maria and I are going to download on that. But first, oh my God, Maria, after weeks of teases, days of leaks, the 2024 NFL schedules finally dropped Wednesday all over the place. And, you know, it's interesting because we saw some pretty cool nuggets coming out for the Atlanta Falcons. So we're going to break down a couple of those more important pieces of the Falcon schedule release, the first six games. To me, Marie, it's kind of a gauntlet because you've got the Pittsburgh Steelers and the return of Arthur Smith. Then you have the Falcons at the Philadelphia Eagles, and then they'll host the world champion Kansas City Chiefs. Now, there are some things that I think are pretty cool. The fact that the Falcons went from zero primetime games to four uh, this particular season. Like we talked about week two at the Eagles, week three versus Chiefs, week five versus the Bucks, week 14, excuse me, 15 versus the Raiders. But going back to the gauntlet, the Steelers, the Eagles, the Chiefs, what excites you about those matchups? And do you see maybe a win or two somewhere in it? First of all, shout out to the social media team for the Atlanta Falcons. Woo! Wow, man, they NFL team, again. bring it back, baby. That was so good. I loved it. And you said your ludicrous voice. He dropped down in the beginning of the video <laughs> like he did at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I freaking loved it. I thought they did such yeah. a good job. Um, it's always the best time of the year. Uh, the NFL has made it a national holiday. Yes. And it's really fun. It's fun for the social media teams to kind of flex their creativity a little bit. So just wanted to give them a shout out because I know they work super hard on that. And it's a lot oh, of work. Indeed. Um, yeah. but here comes the work for the Atlanta Falcons, right? And I said it yesterday. We did uh on 11 Alive, we did a little schedule release breakdown, Reggie Chapman and I. And I said, This is the quarterback effect. This is what you yes. get when you bring yes. a veteran quarterback in. And you know, you need to be thanking the Falcons for that if you're a fan, because you went from having no primetime games to four. It's the most they've had since 2017. They had five back in yes. 2017. So they are mm -hmm. in the spotlight, and the biggest teams in the NFL have four primetime games. They are putting yeah. dividends in the Falcons like they haven't in a long time. And I'm talking about the NFL. So you look I at those it. first couple of games, right? Arthur Smith comes back. I had people tweeting at me that they were going to go to Mercedes-Benz Stadium just to boo him, which a little aggressive, but I know people are still mad. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, don't forget, there's so many familiar faces that are coming over too. Cordero Patterson is on the Steelers now. Justin Fields, he's a yes. local guy. So, all that stuff will be cool. It'll be a nice little homecoming for Arthur Smith, though it's a very mm -hmm. tough matchup for the Falcons. Then, yeah. like you mentioned, straight to Philly on primetime Monday Night Football, and then the Chiefs, the reigning Super Bowl champs here. Like, what? I have dreamt and prayed about times like this since I started covering the Falcons. I'm excited, and I think what's good is I know there's a lot of critiques about Kirk Cousins in primetime. You know, yeah. his overall career he hasn't been the best in prime time however he was very good in a vikings uniform at home so maybe he sneaks one win in at home i don't see it coming against the chiefs honestly but um you know that's a tough stretch and i think that that's a very good measuring stick for how things are going to be for the remainder of the games although they do have the easiest schedule in the nfl tied with the new orleans saints mm -hmm. um I don't know. I, I feel like I'm looking at the schedule right now and I feel like they yeah. could maybe sneak one in there at some point. I don't think it's yeah. going to come against the Eagles. I also don't think it's going to come against the Chiefs. Perhaps the Steelers week one. Maybe I'm crazy, but there's going to be a lot of hype around this team and they're certainly going to want to flex their muscles against Arthur Smith. I could tell you that. Yeah, and I will agree. It's very painful for me as a diehard Steelers fan to <laughs> agree it. with you on that. But I think that, yeah, their best shot is probably the Steelers, maybe the Eagles. It just really depends because both of those teams have retooled so much, but arguably the Steelers probably are the one where you can sneak it because they've retooled at, as you mentioned, Maria, the most important position, which is under center. And we don't even know, let's just be real. They're saying that Russell Wilson is probably going to be QB one, but we don't know what uh -huh. training camp may dictate. You just never know. So the fact that they've got to make a decision up in Pittsburgh on who's going to be their guy could be something that I think could be to the advantage of the Falcons as long as it's not advantage Arthur Smith because he sees something with this defensive front from the Atlanta Falcons that maybe he could take 
advantage of. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. I said, wow, easiest schedule? Like which schedule are they looking at? But probably to your point, oh. looking past that first three, uh, those first three games and that gauntlet that it is, and maybe looking at that next round where it gets a little bit easier because that's when the division games start. You've got the Saints, you've got the Buccaneers, you've got the Panthers. And I think that we've seen in seasons, well, the last couple of seasons where you've had more of those division games kind of stacked towards the end, but here Mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to really make some noise and kind of uh, set, send a message rather to the division early. I think that's where the Falcons can definitely get wins. And I I hope this doesn't sound like me being a homer because I'm not, I just told you guys I'm a Steelers (laughs) fan, but I think that the Falcons, uh, if they happen to stumble and get out one and two or God forbid, oh, and three, yeah. to start the season, they can get right back to 500 in the second in the next group of games. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, it is backloaded when it comes to the NFC South games. And so this, I thought, was very interesting. That was very. probably the biggest surprise for me when I saw the schedule came, come mm-hmm. out. I knew that the Falcons were going to be in primetime more than they had been, yeah, uh, which is easy to do when you never get primetime games anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, we're used to those 1 p.m. kicks around here in Atlanta. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and look, also, I don't think... Uh, this is going off topic a little bit, but I don't think that the Vikings game that could be flexed. It's a 1 PM game right now, but it's possible that they put that in prime time, depending on where we're at. That's all the way in mm-hmm. December. So who knows? I mean, the Falcons may be on top of things and they're like, Hey, wait a second. You got to put them back in prime time. It's Kirk going home. So yep. regardless of that, I mean, you've got five of your six divisional games before your bye week in week 12. That is nuts. So yeah. basically what that means is that obviously you're going to have a full grasp of what the division will look like heading into the last slate of your games. I think that's so great for the Falcons because Mm -hmm. you're either telling yourself, all right, we're going to win this thing. We're going to win the division before even week 12. You'll pretty Mm -hmm. much know unless it's a tight race, um, which it could be. The division has certainly improved. Last year, I felt like it was um, a lot worse off than it is this year. Mm -hmm. collectively though i do i do still think the falcons will win the nfc south um but past week 12 you do have an opportunity too. you got the giants bad you've got the commanders you've got going to the raiders on monday night football which is a fun and intriguing matchup but i think Mm -hmm. the falcons can win that one too so Yeah. yeah i mean the back half of the year having it be a little bit more smooth sailing in terms of the division that's going to help the falcons a ton and you'll know where they're at Yeah, I I think so as well. And I think it's one of those things, too, where if they can really kind of get some good games or or some good wins in there, I think that that can be huge, especially Mm -hmm. for this group that's kind of it's rather a young group, but also a group that's probably still going to be kind of gelling and kind of seeing, okay, where where do we kind of fit in, especially because we talk all the time on the Atlanta football party about the fact that we'll be looking to see how these rotations measure up. By that time, you should really have a much better idea. And when I talk about rotations, of course, talking about it on the defensive side of the ball, but when you start coming into that, that bye week or sort of those games leading up to the bye week, you should certainly have a better idea of just what your defense is, whether it's the a uh, new class, the draft class of 2024 and how they're fitting into the rotation or the guys that know that, hey, you're kind of sort of on the hot seat. This is your opportunity to make something happen. And then you've got that clip, like speaking of the bye week uh, in week 12, you've got that clip heading into the bye where we talked about the first round of the divisional matchups, but then you have a couple matchups squeezed in there where the Falcons go on the road to take on the Bucks. Then they hit Dallas or host Dallas rather than they play the Saints, and they'll take on the Denver Broncos. And Denver, I think that that's another opportunity for them to make waves. I think they could easily, oh, yeah. and again, not trying to sound like a homer or sound overly optimistic, but I think they can get three out of those four games easily. Yeah, and I think that they probably feel the same way if they're looking at the schedule, then no one will admit that in the NFL because every game is hard and every week is different. But there is such an opportunity, especially as you mentioned, in those games to really make a run. And I think I saw someone said, bold prediction, that the Falcons are going to win the NFC. I don't necessarily believe that that's going to happen. I think that's a little bold, um, you know, but certainly we're going to see them be much improved and deserving of the primetime 
primetime games, even if they do lose most of them, I still think it's going to be good that they're in the primetime. And there is yeah. a very good reason why. And it's because they got a quarterback. I, lo I love this. I'm so excited. And I think that this is a very serviceable schedule for the Falcons, Easily. particularly yeah. because of the NFC South situation, as I had mentioned before. But still, even the games that they're taking on that are not in the division, aside from the beginning of the schedule, the gauntlet right. of the beginning of the schedule, I think that they can get a lot of wins out of those. So this is the best time for Kirk Cousins to be in a new uniform because he's got it made. He just has to prove that he can also make things happen on prime yeah. time as he hasn't in the past. Exactly. Yeah. He has an opportunity to do something that is, will be good for him as far as his, his legacy goes. It'll be good for the Falcons, obviously, but yeah, you're right. In addition to the Falcons having a quarterback that is a marquee name, this, because he he's a marquee name now, we're not just having the conversation about the other marquee quarterback, right? We're not just talking about yeah. Jalen Hurts or, or Patrick Mahomes or Dak Prescott. We're actually talking about the marquee quarterback that's right here in Atlanta. So yeah, exciting times. I think that it's going to be really interesting. And of course, real quick, we know that speaking of doing some things on the defensive side of the ball, the Falcons did announce Wednesday that they signed corner Anthony Johnson. He may not be that piece that they're necessarily looking for to complement A.J. Terrell, but certainly we know that he could be potential depth in the secondary. And as you get into the season, depth is always a good thing. Now, it's been a few days since the Atlanta Hawks locked up that number one spot. Okay, I think I got it that time. I think I got my ah, voice did. on. We'll talk about where we all now stand on it with our guy from Locked On Hogs, Brad Rowland, in the deep dive. This episode of the Atlanta Sports Party is brought to you by FanDuel. Well, it is that time of the year, guys, where we are knee deep in the postseason. And it's knee deep in the postseason, not just for the NBA, but of course, also on the NHL side as well. And you have an opportunity to make it pay out for you as well. It's winner take all time, and you can bring home a big win of your own. How do you do that? With FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. So if you were one of those people who bet, for example, that the Celtics would take down the Cavs and it would only take them five games to do it, Kudos to you because, hey, that's exactly how that happened. Also, player props. We've got still a lot of great players from Atlanta Metro who are making a splash in the NBA postseason, including Jalen Brown and Anthony Edwards. So there's opportunity there. How many goals are going to be scored in the whole of the NHL postseason? You can make bets on that as well. How do you do it? Go to FanDuel.com. It's FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's how you make every playoff shot count in the NHL and the NBA. Again, it's FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count because FanDuel is America's number one sports book. With virtually no chance to land the number one pick, 3% chance to be exact, the Atlanta Hawks did something they've never done in franchise history, at least mm -hmm. in the lottery era. They won the first pick in the NBA draft. Who would have thought it? But it happened. But now comes the hard work in deciding what to do with it. And that's why Marie and I have our guy, Brad Roland of Locked On Hawks, here to break it down and give us his thoughts on where do the Hawks go from here. So this week, of course, was the NBA Combine out in Chicago, Brad. And there were some returns coming out of the combo. Some were mixed as far as Alex Sar, who's the guy who everybody is saying, hey, if you do keep the number one pick, that's where you should go. But just out of curiosity, were there any returns coming out of Combine, whether for Sar or anyone else, that make you maybe more or less inclined to want to see the Hawks keep this pick? I think it's really – it's super open. And the combine, there's a whole debate about the Combine and how important it is. The NFL Combine is much more important than the NBA Combine is the short way Indeed. to put that. It's <laughs> yeah. the, the, the top guys, they're actually doing more than they've ever done. Uh, there's actually a change in the rules where guys have to show up now. A lot of the top picks didn't even show up before until this right. year. Now they have to be measured at least and like kind of do the testing and things like that. But nobody's playing scrimmages. And it's Alex saw the guys who were the top picks coming in pro probably all measured kind of what they're supposed to measure. There was no huge shock. And he looked the part physically. So, no, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's, it's not fun to say no, but there really isn't anything that changed a ton by, by the combine. And that was probably to be expected, to be honest. Yeah. And I'll tell you, for me, it, it's very interesting, Maria, because 
I, I think the same thing that Brad said, like, we know that the Underwear Olympics, also known as the NFL Combine, <laughs> is a thing. <laughs> In fact, it's a week-long thing where we really do pay attention to guys because a lot of guys, their st doc, uh, stock draft, rather, will go up. And a lot of guys, your draft will go, their stock draft will go down. But yeah, the NBA Combine is just kind of a little bit different. Uh, not as much attention, but I think maybe this year, to Brad's point, because there was pretty much a mandate for those guys to show up, you actually got to see a little something, which for us, Maria, might be important because most of us have not had an opportunity to lay eyes on Alex Sar and what he's able to do as a potential should the Hawks decide to keep that pick. Yeah, and I think if you're looking at the NFL and NBA combine and you're comparing them, just the numbers are totally different too. Yeah. You know, there's so many more guys in the NFL that you have to explore. In the NBA, you kind of know what you're getting to an extent. This is a different draft in the sense that there are some more guys that do need some more homework for a lot of these teams. Um, you know, of course, we joked about it. This is the one year that the Hawks get it. And of all the years where there's so many question marks, it goes to the Atlanta Hawks. But it's good because <laughs> the combine can pay dividends for you in that sense that they need to do their homework on some of these guys and decide whether or not they need to keep this pick or not. And there are question marks around Sar, even though he is presumably going to be the top pick. It's not a sure sell that he will be. Um, mm -hmm. There's questions from him on the offensive side of his game. So by going to the combine, kind of exploring that a little bit, I think you can answer some questions for yourself, not to the extent that you would get in the NFL combine, but certainly doing your homework at the NBA combine is important. And Maria, I think that's a great point that you made because for me, it's not a foregone conclusion as well. I might be in that kind of a bucket or might be on the side of saying, hey, not so much that it's about maybe packaging, although we'll talk about the possibility of packaging in a minute. But I think for me, Brad, I'm also not kind of 100 percent sold on like going with the number one pick, keeping the number one pick. Maybe it's Alex R, whomever it is, because I think. Just a week ago, we were talking about them maybe at the 10th spot, whether they move up, move back, what would they kind of do, and talking about where you'd really want to pull a guy in, whether that be for the front court, where I think the, the most desperate need is for that team, <laughs> to be honest, or whether you felt like you needed uh, just a little bit more depth uh, in the backcourt. But whatever the case may be, I think one of the things that it makes, it's intriguing for me as well to kind of look at what we saw uh, in Chicago this week or kind of what the returns are overall is, okay, fine. If your first option is Alex Sar, that's okay. But if your other option, what, what's, I guess, what's that second option? Because I know that part of the thing that, come on, Maria, come on, Brad, keep it real. There was conversation about at the trade deadline is why didn't the Hawks move? But in order for you to package anything, don't you still have to have a partner? So that kind of begs my question of what do you think is the second best or most viable second option for these guys? Yeah, trades are hard. To your point, I, I think it's always easy from the outside to be like, just trade this guy, this guy. And it's, well, you have to have someone agree to that trade. And there's, especially in the NBA, you have to match shot. There's all these weird things you have to do in the NBA. It's, yeah. Trades are so hard to make in the NBA. Um, I think that they could, they could trade this pick. It would not, I wouldn't fall on the floor, but in my entire <laughs> life, the number one pick's been traded twice in 30 plus years. It doesn't happen very often. It's because teams don't, honestly, there's, there's a risk factor when you trade the number one pick, because if somebody oh, makes yeah. that pick, and you could have had that player, and that player becomes a superstar. It looks really bad for you. Um, that's yeah. only part of it. That's only part of it, but that's part of it too. And I think that it what for me. It's at least on in mid May. It's not Alex R or Bust. I don't think he's the right. only guy you can take at number one. There are other options. Okay. It's just that he's kind of become the semi consensus guy, mm -hmm. and he, he's a good fit in Atlanta for all the defensive stuff. But I think that you know you can debate on how much they're trying to be real about it but Landry has said as he kind of has to say that they're going to cast a wide net and i mm -hmm. that that's right that's what they should do it, it it's sort of gm speak but it's also true that they they shouldn't just narrow in on a guy on may 16th and make that pick based on that like there's due diligence to be done and i think there are there are other guys to draft there are also trades to evaluate and if they circle back in a month and they decide sars their guy you just take Indeed, indeed. And Maria, I think that's a great point that Brad makes. You kind of can't expect anything but GM speak at this point. And you and I know oh so well uh, covering the Atlanta Falcons that it can look a certain way, a certain way, a certain way. And as you get closer to the time to make the decision in the draft, it could take a left turn. So we really don't know so far away from that time what's going to happen. But I will say this. I want to ask you this question because you and I have kind of talked about it on some of our other uh, shows this week and just kind of you and I in passing. 
But we've now all had a couple of days to kind of mull over this thing as well. And so many scenarios have been thrown out there, including, you know, like Brad, sa Brad said, it's not that Alex Sar is the consensus number one. We might actually see a package deal if there's even a potential to do it. But when you look across the landscape, is there a Hawks player or even players that you'd be comfortable with the Hawks packaging, maybe to get more veteran presence or support, or maybe to get some of that draft capital back from that DeJounte Murray trade? Yeah, I mean, I think the point that Landry Fields is the art of saying a whole lot of words without truly saying nothing <laughs> really drives home around this time of year. You know, he did say he's going to cast a wide net, and he talked about it right after they got the number one pick, that they're going to keep their options open. I think that's incredibly important, and it's not like the Hawks have never not explored trades in the past. It just hasn't worked out for them. You know, they listened to people when it came to DeJounte Murray even last year, so it is possible that they package that top pick they give up another player I mean they're gonna have to give stuff up in return as well I think Clint Capella is a name that we've seen a lot floated out there recently as somebody who could depart the the talking about the Falcons the Hawks um and I think that I would be okay you know I would leave Atlanta without a true big but there are other ways to supplement that for this team so I think Clint Capella would be the first person. I know there's so many question marks around. Is Trey going to be back next year? He signed with the new agency. There's a lot of rumors out there. And then also DeJounte Murray, because they've been open to trading him in the past, or at least listen to other teams. But that's also part of the due diligence, right? Whenever you have a player like that, you do have to listen to other teams in terms of a trade. Clint Capella seems like the most realistic for me. Um, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that Trey Young is not in a Hawks uniform next year either. Yeah. I think, I think there's kind of two or three pathways. Like one is the more conventional one where you maybe move on from Clint Capella or DeAndre Hunter. Those guys are per, uh, perennially in trade rumors and the, it makes yeah. sense. They're not changing your life. They're solid players, but they're not changing your life. Or you have, like Marie just alluded to, you have the buzz around Trey and that, that's a more franchise changing decision. If Definitely. you're even thinking about trading Trey Young, that's a, that's a big shift from where it's been the last six years where he's been the untouchable guy on your roster. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a whole other discussion to even have later but yeah i think that they're they're definitely in the mix you know prior to the number one pick and getting it we all kind of thought that they were going to do something different they were not going to run this team back after another play and loss like they were going to make a substantial change somewhere and there's basically almost a consensus that they're going to do something in the backcourt whether it's Trey mm -hmm. or jante it's like everyone in the league's like there's no way they're doing this again with these guys yeah, so yeah. we'll we'll see but i think they're they're going to make a move or two or three somewhere beyond the decision number one I yeah. think just getting the number one pick just makes it that much more interesting, right? Because yeah. we have said for a very long time that the Hawks do need to do something and do something big in order to shake things up. They don't want to be a consistent play-in team, and that's what they are right now. That's the narrative yeah. around the Hawks. They're middle of the pack, maybe even shy towards the bottom of the NBA. And so you need to do something very different to make it work, and you can't have a backcourt like that and have results like that and not change things. Yeah. And you talk about that. And, you know, we can talk about this because it's a sports party. The fact that the Falcons were bold in that, you know, they went for the number eight pick. They went with a quarterback. No one saw it coming. But in their minds they are saying, hey, we're going to be bold. They went bold with Kirk Cousins. But here's why I'm bringing that into our conversation as well, Brad. They could go bold with a Michael Penix Jr. because that was something that their GM, Terry Fontenot, mm -hmm. their head coach, Raheem Morris, said, hey, it's it's bust for us. We saw what happened. With the previous re regime, they were out the door and out of Flowery Branch because of that guy under center twice over that didn't work for them. <laughs> so, hey, we're going to do something bold. We're going to go out and get uh, Michael Penix Jr. We're going to go out and get Kirk Cousins. But here's the thing, Brad. You can get a Kirk Cousins because the Falcons have established themselves as a destination for big time veterans. I think that's the thing that we kind of don't talk about a lot as well for the mm -hmm. Hawks, in addition to the fact that trades are challenging in the NBA there are, other than Clint Capella and the shocking get of DeJounte Murray. Let's just be real. They got Clint Capella in February of the, what is it? Four seasons ago. They got mm -hmm. Clint Capella in February when he was coming off an injury. They didn't even get to see him in action until that next season. So he wasn't exactly someone that every team was going after in the association, right? DeJounte Murray wasn't even on the trade block. It happened to be a situation where there was a relationship between Landry Fields and the San Antonio Spurs. They knew they were kind of in rebuild mode. So they give DeJounte the opportunity to kind of opt out, if you will. But there's word, a lot of word that's circulating around the association. This is not a destination spot 
for a lot of top tier veterans. So if it's not Brad, then maybe that's even more important to Maria's point, why you've got to make the right call on this number one pick and what you do with it, because this might be your one shot either to get that guy who could potentially be a game changer. If you don't mind a reset, this is not going to be a rebuild, but a reset <laughs> Or you better figure out how to package that number one pick so you, that you can get a veteran presence that you wouldn't otherwise get because you've not established yourself as a place of destination. No, it's a great point. I, and I think that in the NBA, the currency is your best players. You're not going to win anything at the highest, highest levels if you don't have the guys at the, at the highest levels. That's, that's, the, that's the reality of the league. So it's uh, it, it, this is not the year, to Maria's point earlier, to win, the, to win the lottery. If you had to pick a year, this wouldn't have been it. But it's still a pretty- <laughs> It's still, a, it's still oh, well. a prime. It's a prime asset. You know what I mean? Like it's still a number one. But number one pick. You can pick, you can pick anybody you want to, and you have to treat it like that. Even if it's not Women Yama or any of those guys, like there's it's a there's a pathway there to change your franchise. If that player hits at that level, then along with whoever else you want to pair him with, that's a different discussion. You have to have those top guys, and the Hawks have never really been able to land the the, the top 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 guy. Even the you know the guys that are most famous, Dwight, Dwight Howard was not Dwight Howard when he got to Atlanta. Like the guys yep. who are most. They haven't gotten that in in their prime superstar other than through the draft. And that's here we are again in, in the draft near the top. And it's a good chance for them. Indeed. Here we are again. So this is one of those where I put a meme out there on Twitter right after we knew about the number one pick. And I said, you have one job. So hopefully <laughs> that one job is something that our guys with the Atlanta Hawks will get right. Appreciate you stopping by our guy, Brad Roland. From Locked On Hawks. When we come back, it's officially dream season. And Maria and I are going to download on it in Around the Metro. All right, Maria, you know, you and I, we absolutely love when we can come on and talk about some dubs and the dream, the Atlanta dream got one to open their 2024 campaign. They were out West taking on the Los Angeles Sparks Wednesday night, got the 92-81 win to go up 1-0 to kick off the regular season. How good was it to see this team go on the road and get a win to start the regular season? I thought it was great. I think there's really good things ahead for this dream team. They're fun. Yeah. Um, they're young, but they do have a nice mix of veterans who can lead the way as well. And Ryan mm-hmm. Howard getting into her, it's not even, she's not a veteran now, but she's right. getting <laughs> into a veteran presence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she dropped 25 on opening night for them. I think that she's going to continue to grow into her own. And she's one of the young ladies that is pushing the WNBA to new heights. Uh, mm-hmm. I certainly think so. It's all of these top overall picks that are, and, and beyond that too, not just the number one picks, but Ryan was that a couple of years ago, you know, they are putting and shining a new spotlight on the W. And so this yes. team is so fun. They're fun to watch. Uh, they can generate offense and, you know, they, they definitely have a high ceiling. And mm-hmm. I think that this was just a taste of what's to come. I think so too. And what I loved about last night's game is there's something that we would see last season, right? Where this team would battle with the best of them in the W and in that fourth quarter, whether they were up or whether they were tied, they just could not close the deal. And so last night, you get to the third quarter and literally first quarter tie halftime tie third quarter oh, yeah. tie and all of a sudden you get to the fourth quarter they go on a 9-0 run and you're thinking okay this is good they're doing it on the offensive side of the ball they're mixing it up with four out of their five starters in double digits so like you said ryan just had an amazing game tina charles had a good game too but sure. all of the starters really were able to pour in but i think what might have been the most impressive and what you and i may be talking about deep into the season, if not the postseason, is how they reset when the Sparks came back. And it's like, oh, gosh, is it going to be what we saw last season? No, their defense. They got stops at the right time and they were able to pull out the one. I think that was something that was very, very encouraging that Dream fans should be encouraged about the fact that now this team is starting to show that they can do it at both ends of the court. Yeah. And even in the preseason, they had talked about that, right? Because yes, it's the yes. preseason, but you're trying to figure things out and how you mm-hmm. want things to look. So when I was in Indianapolis covering the dream, when they were playing the fever, they were so close. I mean, they were literally within yes. a point when the seconds were counting down in the fourth quarter. So one of those things is closing out the games. And that was a clear indicator is that they were frustrated by the end of that game and that there was a lot of stuff to work on is exactly what they told me after that one. And I think that they were alluding to the fact that they hadn't been able to close out those games in the past. And 
again, it's the preseason, so I didn't really take a lot into that. And this was a right. great display of they can switch things up and they can finish games. And that's going to be the biggest thing for this young team. They made their first playoff appearance in a while last year. Um, yes. I fully expect them to build off of that. They, they're also a really fun group. You know, if you're mm -hmm. if you're maybe thinking, okay, I hear the buzz about the WMD and maybe I should pay attention, which I don't know why you weren't before, but nevertheless. Um, but if you're just now paying attention to the WNBA, this team in particular is a great group of ladies and they're yes. very fun and there'll be a lot of fun to pay attention to. There's a lot of talent, a lot of young talent. So I think last night really had that on full display. I'm excited. Yeah. And you make a great point about the fact that they're fun to be around. And this is a team that's starting to figure out what their role is. Haley Jones also had a good game. We haven't even seen Jordan Haley. Canada yet because she's right. She's been mm -hmm. out uh, with some uh, with a hand injury rather. But mm -hmm. another thing that I saw that I thought was really good and really encouraging is to see that Cheyenne Parker Tyus will be able to finally play the role that she wants to play, which is she wants to play the four. And she was an all star and played out of position last season. So, man, what are we going to see from her? And of course, to get the incomparable Tina. Charles on this team mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it the fact that she's able to contribute really on and off the court because she brings the veteran presence but please everybody don't get it twisted it is not just about what she does in that locker room Tina Charles had a double double last night it was a 21 12 type of night for her and that was a huge reason she had six boards in that final quarter that was a huge reason that they were able to get the win but speaking of Indiana Maria we just got word this morning that the dream announced that the game on June 21st the game on August 26th both home games against the Indiana Fever will be played at State Farm Arena those games of course will feature some of the top players in the league like Ryan Howard Alicia Gray Ali of Boston and of course Caitlin Clark so it's exciting to see that uh fever that's coming no pun intended with Caitlin <laughs> Clark in Indiana but I'll be honest with you I'm not shocked about it as well because we've seen you and I have seen over the last couple of seasons that the dream have sold out on a consistent basis Gateway mm -hmm. Center down here in College Park so not surprised yes a lot of that is about Caitlin Clark but it's also about a great product that the dream brings to the table as well yeah, I mean, look, the Dream were only the second team in WNBA history to sell out their season ticket allotment before the season even started. Yeah. So there is a lot of excitement around this team in particular. And and people here in Atlanta really do love the W, and I'm proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to live in a city that loves the WNBA just like you and I do. Um, but, you know, Gateway Center doesn't hold a lot of people, and that's, right. that's obvious. And so if you want to create revenue like you know you can and capitalize on the Caitlin Clark effect – you move to another arena and State Farm is waiting and ready and very serviceable for that to happen. And, you know, when I was talking to people within the organization of the dream a couple of weeks ago, asking them because I saw other teams in the league going ahead and moving to other arenas, mm -hmm. I said, OK, how does this process work? How do you decide that this is the right move to take? Because it's obviously a huge overhead going from a WNBA arena to an NBA arena. There is a cost that comes with that. So, Indeed. and that was part of what they said is trying to decide whether or not it's worth it. Can you cover the cost? Is it going to be worth it financially for your team? You don't want to take a hit financially just to move to another building. Right. Um, and again, it's not just for Caitlin Clark, though I do love her and I love the effect that she's having on the WNBA. It's about the other ladies in it. You mentioned yes. Amalia Boston was another number one overall pick for the Indiana Fever. So, you know, there's a lot of women creating a lot of excitement and you're going to see tickets, A, very expensive and yep. B, they're going to sell out very quickly. And that's awesome. When were we ever talking about this before? It's not that the WNBA wasn't exciting because it always has been, in my opinion. I just mm -hmm. think this is a new era of younger women who remember yeah. the younger women kind of skew more on social. They're more out there more than the veterans of the WMEA and the mm -hmm. women that built the platform for these, yeah. these ladies to do what they're doing. But man, it's fun. I'm excited. It Bring is. it on. Stay for Marina. I'll be there. You'll be there. It's going to be yeah. a great time. Exactly. And you guys need to come out as well, because like you said, the dream a couple of seasons back used to play at State Farm Arena. So, yeah, they had to make sure that this was the right time to return to State Farm Arena. And I definitely think it is. You're going to see some great play from the W. We appreciate you guys stopping by the Atlanta Sports Party. The Locked On Sports Atlanta YouTube channel is now streaming live 24-7. It's all things Atlanta Sports 24-7. And, of course, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and download us wherever you get your podcast because, hey, we're free and available. We'll see you on Monday on the Atlanta Football Party.